Hello, everyone, and welcome to the midweek program at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. My name is Blake, and I'm the education assistant here at the Arboretum. And today we are on the rooftop garden, uh, Paisley Pinnacle, I believe this section was just referred to me. Uh, we just called it that. Uh, Tim said that him and Doug used to call it that because of the shape of the rocks uh, back when they first installed it. But there's a handful of little spring ephemerals growing in this chunk of the garden. And today we've got a program for you all about spring ephemerals. Our Research technician Tim Alderton here has pulled together a nice little presentation showing off some of the exotic spring ephemerals and then we will go into our natives as well. So that will be a lot of fun. Alrighty. Those of you who are watching this on YouTube, please like this video and subscribe to our channel and feel free to leave a comment down below. And with the announcements out of the way, I think we can pass things over to Tim to teach us about some spring ephemerals. Hello. Yes, uh, my topic today is spring ephemerals, of course. So uh, I thought I would start out telling you what an ephemeral is. And so I got a few definitions for you. I don't do that very often. So I looked it up on, on, online, of course. And I think this is from the Oxford Dictionary, the, the most simple uh, definition I found for ephemeral, not ephemeral plants, not spring ephemeral, whatever, is just, just plain old ephemeral, is um, lasting for a very short time. And that basically ephemeral comes from the Greek uh, ephemeros, and I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly in Greek, but that's the way it looks. So, which basically translates to only lasting only a day. So we do have some plants like that that have flowers that only last a day or very short a time. Like if anybody came here last summer and saw the amorphophallus in flower, that you might call an ephemeral. It lasted a whole two and a half days. Um, the actual opening of the in closing of the flower, so, or inflorescence. So that is a much more extreme ephemeral than uh, a lot of the stuff that we will be seeing uh, uh, today. But going a little deeper now, so an ephemeral plant. So just the general ephemeral plant, regardless of the season, uh, this is a definition for that. Plants with very short life cycles or are very uh, are only actively in growth for a very short period during which um, uh, it's a period of favorable conditions. Uh, so uh, plants that take uh, um, advantage of, you know, more light or uh, more water availability or the appropriate temperature. Um, uh, so they're active in that uh, short period of time. And um, I'll get a little deeper maybe with some of that here later on. And then it's the final little definition, I guess, would be the spring ephemeral. So, and that refers to plants that emerge quickly in spring and die back to the ground or die back to their underground parts after a short period uh, in reproductive phase. So, um, you probably actually know lots of these plants, especially the non-native ones, uh, which I'm going to focus on first, and then we'll jump into some of the, the native ones But um, that you might get to go out and see in the coming weeks and months uh, this, uh, this year now. So anyways, uh, so some of the environments that are really good for these ephemerals, whether they're uh, spring ephemerals or just general ephemerals, are with I uh, think about plants from the desert. They might periodically grow um, during a period when there's actually rain and they may come up just over a matter of a couple uh, weeks and then they are done in a matter of uh, days. Um, and kind of like that for our summer gardens here, we have rain lilies, the zephyranthes, which flower periodically after heavy rains, which um, in the wild, some of the species are in much more xeric conditions than what we grow them here in the uh, in our climate. And so within, say, three days of a heavy rain, they're in flower. And within a week, they've already set seed. And uh, those seeds ripen in about two weeks, and they're done. So, uh, but then they repeat, but, um, depending on the weather. And then, um, so what we are dealing with here is more of the temperature though uh, and lighting uh, the, with our ephemeral. So some places where uh, temperatures and moisture and lighting are more uh, favorable at different times of the year would be places like the Mediterranean in particular with excess of water, uh, access to the water again, uh, and cooler temperatures. Uh, so, so many of our uh, spring ephemerals that we uh, get from other countries, especially come from the Mediterranean, the ones that you're so, for, uh, so familiar with, uh, like um, 
narcissus, uh, the daffodils. Those are primarily Southern Europe uh, and the Mediterranean into Asia Minor area. And they uh, respond to the availability of, uh, of light and water because they often grow in uh, forest edges or in grasslands. Uh, and it gets hot and dry in the Mediterranean in the summer. The water's not there, but during the winter months, it is uh, there and also the light is there. So. Um, that's one of those. So again, I'm saying a lot of these are Mediterranean and um, another one in the Amaryllidaceae and a, a very similar uh, it's, uh, uh, in reality is uh, Lycogum estivalum um, and the uh, summer snowdrops, which I find funny because for us, they flower anytime from January until April, but um, or just um, the snowflakes, I should say, not snowdrops, but um, they are reminiscent of the smaller uh, snow drops, which oh, this one's saying I hate you because I dug it out. Um, the cut flowers actually last them better, but this is um, Galanthus nivalis, uh, which I've been talking about Galanthus and other um, programs I've done recently, and I really like those for our cool season uh, growers. Um, some other ones from that same region of the world, and we see are some of the plants in the Iridaceae, the iris family. And we have uh, here we have a retic iris reticulata pauline, which is a cultivar. But uh, this again comes from uh, Eastern Mediterranean into Asia Minor, uh, the Mediterranean, or that is the Middle East area. Uh, and that again uh, responds to the cool season, it, uh, summer dormant. It, its growth will come up. It's just coming up as it flowers, and um, will do its whole life cycle in a matter of about two months and then go dormant again. Uh, the, their cousins, of course, the even more familiar for spring, of course, are the crocus. If you don't have squirrels, you can have those here very easily, <clears throat> but I have squirrels. But anyways, again, these actually often grow even in the mountains and they will start flowering just as the snow is melting, um, the higher elevations even in Southern uh, Europe and Asia Minor again. Um, but then they go dormant through the summer months they, uh, after they quickly grow and uh, do their life cycle. So a few others from that or that region would be the hyacinths, uh, which there's a lot of hyacinth relatives uh, throughout um, the old world. So or Africa and uh, Europe and uh, Western Asia, you'll get a lot of hyacinth ACE. And these are true hyacinths here. This is hyacinths uh, from the garden. I have Anastasia and I think maybe the white or pale pink one here is, I think Carnegie, but I can't remember. It smells wonderful. But again, winter active plants um, uh, for us. And then their, their little cousin, the Muscaris, the um, the grape hyacinths uh, and there's a bunch of other ones Scyllas and uh, Pushkinia and Chionodoxa all very uh, similar and they are all spring ephemerals or late winter uh, ephemerals for us here in the southeast so uh, those are the familiar ones and then um, there aren't as many, uh, or these are all monocots I'm doing so far, from other places, but uh, another group would be some um, in the Alliaceae, the Allium family. And this is uh, an Ithion, Uniflorum. Um, and these are actually from Uruguay, Paraguay, um, northern Argentina. I had the opportunity to see some close relatives of these uh, in November, in early December, um, in Argentina. But... Um, uh, these are some true spring ephemerals for us that uh, they start flowering, uh, they start to leaf out late fall, early winter, and they grow through the uh, winter and they start flowering sometimes in January and they will go in again to April. Then they quickly go dormant uh, by the end of April and early May. So um, there's some really nice blues and whites of those, but so these are actually some of the more common ones. And then you get um, other plants. These are, again are, um, from Asia Minor area, uh, Eastern Europe. This is a Ranunculaceae, the buttercup family. Um, and this is a uh, Erythrina, not Erythrina, I'm sorry, Aranthes. Aranthus, get my syllables right. Uh, Aranthus hamalis, which uh, one of the winter aconites. Uh, so those 
literally pop up overnight. Uh, about three, two to three weeks ago, there were none in the garden. And the following, I, I, went, I saw, looked on Friday one week, and on Saturday I was back here doing a program at the end of Ju January, and there were some in flower. They weren't there the day before. They weren't out of the ground. So talk, uh, talk about a true ephemeral there. Um, some of their other cousins and. Uh, in the ranunculaceae, the buttercup family, these are some of the anemones. And these are Mediterranean, uh, Greece, and, uh, is a, and the islands. You will often find some of these anemone coronarias. Um, and then there's the anemone blandas, which there's actually a couple over here, but they're not flowering yet for me, but uh, they're a little bit later. Um, so some of the more familiar um, ephemerals that we see, you can actually buy them for that. But those are all from Mediterranean type climates, which they have hot, dry summers for the most part, um, and the plants go dormant. Um, what our native ones are a little bit different. Um, they often are found in uh, forested areas or in grass, uh, open grassy areas on the, along the edges. And uh, our native ephemerals will um, open up and grow actively before the, the forest dwelling ones, before the major leaf canopy covers them up and blocks out the sun. And also in the case of the forest, the trees tend to soak up all the water then uh, through the summer months and it stays relatively dry. So it mimics the same conditions that a lot of these uh, Mediterranean plants are experiencing. But we have these uh, locations throughout um, the Piedmont in particular here in, in North Carolina. And, but there's a different palette of plants in, other, in the mountains and in the coast, you'll get some different plants too, but they're all follow the same um, cycle due to the openness and then it, the canopy cover uh, coming in. And uh, I mentioned grasslands, some of them, you know, they turn brown, they die back. And then there's a few things that will pop up through uh, that during the winter months. So I'm gonna go refer now to um, uh, Blake to get into uh, some PowerPoint presentation that I have uh, put together of our natives because I truly don't have that many uh, of them in the garden, but um, some of them make better uh, garden plants than others. And the availability of them is actually um, uh, more of a challenge than say a lot of these Mediterranean plants that have been grown for millennia now uh, in Europe and were transported over here uh, during colonial periods and we continue to grow them today. We haven't adopted the native ones in the same way that we have um, uh, the, the ones from Europe uh, and even South America. Uh, so, and ours aren't always as flashy, though there are some that are pretty uh, spectacular in their own right, I will say. But uh, in the next couple of weeks, actually, this is about the time of the year I will start to go out in um, the woods around Raleigh, actually, and um, and look for some of the, the, the wildflowers that will start to open, the true ephemerals. And so we're going to uh, get in here to our list, and I'm going to uh, start... Um, illustrating a few of those to you. So um, the first one I have, well, I think uh, slides I have are uh, cardamony. Is that about the uh, same, right? It sure is. Okay, good. So, and there's one I can't spit its name out. I'm gonna, uh, is cardamony uh, conca uh, tanata. And uh, that's, it's one of the tooth warts or um, Bitter or crest, bitter crest is one of them. We have lots of weeds in this this genus, but these are some that are a little bit prettier and much more spectacular uh, to look at than some of the weedy ones, which are probably in this bed right next to me. Uh, our native, also our native Cardamony caroliniana is a, a wonderful pot weed for us. Uh, <laughs> it's a true annual, but um, uh, this cardamony is much more um, spectacular in my uh, in that the colors are often anywhere from white to pale pink and even some deeper shades that have some purple. Uh, there's a second photo, I believe, and I think uh, uh, it's probably of the purple one. The second one's the white one. Oh, the white one. Oh, yeah. I'll flip flop them anyways. But anyways, I have there's some color variation uh, variation for the cardamones. Um, so anyways, and there's several species. Um, we actually, well, going back, I don't know if we can flip over back to me. This looks nice and wilted. Um, but this is a cardamony uh, bulbosa that um, Tony Avent introduced, and this is actually flowering in the white garden. Now I dug up a little hunk of it, and it's saying I hate you. But uh, this is cardamony bulbosa, um, and I think it is snow showers, and it was collected 
really far from here in Halifax County. So um, this is another species. I have not seen this one around here. The Conda uh, Canada, I've seen that here in Raleigh. Uh, I've seen it at places like, if you ever get the chance to go to uh, White Pines Preserve, um, it, it's, it's fairly common around here for a few weeks, um, late February into mid-March, and you won't see them again. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll be done flyer. And also just on the south side of Raleigh, uh, there's a good location in, uh, I can never remember what it's called. But anyways, it's a, a long swift creek, um, and it's not um, Hemlock Bluffs, but it's to the east of the, but anyways. Um, so that's a cardamony, and the cardamonies are actually in the cabbage family. So. The next plant I think I have on there are the Claytonias, uh, Claytonia virginica. So those are spring beauties. Uh, and um, they are in the Montiacee. So it used to be in the Portulacaceae, the Portulaca family, but they, they've split them out into a new family. But anyways, it's much more common in the Western United States uh, and actually South, Central and South America than it is here in Eastern United States, uh, the Montiacee. But Claytonia virginica is a ubiquitous spring flower are here. Um, you can go out anywhere from probably late February, early March, and until the end of April, and you can still find the spring beauties and flower. Uh, they're often in uh, floodplains is where I see them the most. So these aren't places we typically have in our landscape <laughs> in reality. Uh, and so, I mean, they will grow in your landscape if you can find them. They're not easy to source, but where you will find them, um, uh, they can literally cover the ground in white um, to pale pink with pink pinstriping down the, the petals pretty often. And they're in clusters. Um, so they, they, in mass, they make a spectacular show. And an individual plant, you have to really look to see them. But they are there and um, it, it, they make a, a really uh, attractive uh, thing to see in the wild. And I highly recommend, not all these plants are conducive for our, our landscapes as they are. Uh, so I encourage you, uh, normally we do cultivated plants here, but this is the time of year to, to see these in the wild. Take a walk. And so for all these, you may start to see them and it'll brighten your day, especially when you go out in February and start to see them. So, but those will be coming really soon. The next one is actually, uh, it's a Corridalis. It may have another genus now. I didn't look it up, but uh, Corridalis flavu flavula. Uh, it's a little yellow uh, relative of the bleeding hearts. So this is uh, Fumaraceae or Papaveraceae, depending on your lump or splitter. They may have even put it in another family now. Are I don't remember. Are you talking Dutchman's breeches? Yes. Oh okay. no, Dutchman's breeches. Oh darn, that's after. Did I skip the... I didn't give you that one. Oh, here's Corridalis. The Corridalis would be right before it maybe, or it's did I put right it after, after it? it? Oops, I got out of alphabetical order, darn. Uh, but anyways, yes, it's related to that uh, Dutchman's breeches, which we're gonna be showing up here in just a second. So um, these are actually quite tiny. They might be uh, six to eight inches tall, but little yellow flowers. A uh, place I typically see these, uh, again, is we're in flood, pl flood plains and slopes going down to it, uh, the flood plains. And I see, I've seen these at White Pine Preserve and if anybody's been to Penny's Bend, um, you'll often see those in late March um, and early April as well. And uh, the next plant then, if you go back up to the Dicentra um, Cucularia, which is the Dutchman's Breeches, uh, that one, you've, it's only in a few locations in this part of the state. Um, and uh, one of them that I've get the chance to, and I get there at the right time because they don't last long. It's just a matter of a week or two, you get good flowering or the, um, uh, those dicentras, the Dutchman's breeches, and you can find them at Penny's Bend, uh, just north on the northeast side of, um, of Durham. And supposedly they're at Pine, um, White Pines Preserve too, uh, southwest of here, but I have not found them there yet. But I find the, its cousin, the Corridalis there, um, are growing on the slopes um, along, I believe, the Deep River, and I can't remember what the other one is there, but there's two rivers that meet. Um, but it's a really cool uh, place to see so many of these wildflowers, especially actually that Ver Claytonia virginica that we saw a few minutes ago. Uh, the next one, Erythronium umbilicatum, uh, those are super early. Those will be opening 
if not next in the next or they could be open now i have not gotten out in the woods uh locally for uh yet this spring or this winter i should say winter early spring um but i would not be surprised if some of these are opening now and they will only they will go through mid-march and they are the trout lilies and uh it's the dimpled trout lily if i remember right without since i only gave myself the latin names i did not give myself the common names that i put on my slides um so they have these really cool um, camouflage leaves. And then uh, typically you have um, a yellow flower, which the, the, the sepals are actually um, kind of brownish on the outside. And um, then you have the yellow inside. But uh, there's two slides of that, I think, of the typical uh, species. And then I have the third slide. There's, an, if you search high and low, when it, it, it places like White Pines Preserve and the other is it cliffs of Swift, or it's something on Swift Creek. It's on Holly Spring Road, and I can't think of what it is right now. But anyways, there's a really nice natural uh, area there. That's where I've seen the most of them. They literally cover the ground uh, for a few weeks in late February and March. Um, and um, you can occasionally find a white or uh, albino type flowered one where it lacks the yellow pigmentation. And um, I found them right here in uh, Crabtree Valley, part of, uh, of Raleigh off of Edwards Mill down in the woods when I used to live there. Um, and they are around. I don't see them very often when I go to Umstead, which I find so um, ironic. But uh, you can find them at Penny's Bend as well. Um, so from the Erythroniums, we're going to go to Houstonias. And I have uh, two uh, different Houstonias I'm going to show you. The Houstonia cerulea, which is probably the most noticeable one. Uh, and, and I have a, a, an oddball one is what I'm using for my photo of that. It's actually a white flowered form. And these are commonly called bluets. And um, if you look up in the the upper right hand corner, I think, uh -huh. of the picture, there's, it, there is a blue one there. But... Um, the main clump there is a white flowered one. That is actually right along the, the road into the parking lot at uh, White Pines Preserve. And I've seen that same clump now for like three or four years. So it, it's, it's in there, but um, you'll find them in the open woods and uh, the bluettes will flower for quite some time uh, here, uh, anywhere from, oh, probably about now, late February until April, the end of April, maybe even into the first of uh, May until they actually go dormant for us here in the Piedmont. Uh, and then the next one I can't spit out as easily. Let's see if I can do it though. Uh, is Houstonia serpifolia, and I have misplaced, uh, misspelled on my sheet here, but it should be right on the, the list there. And it's, I think, I think of it as the thyme leaf or creeping uh, Houstonia, I don't, or bluette. I don't know what the common name is for that one offhand. It might say there. Um, did I put a common name? Thyme leaf bluet. Okay, so, and I think of creeping thyme as, uh, is like thymus serfilifolia as well, or something like that. So, um, anyways, it's a creeping one. Uh, you'll sometimes actually find it in lawns. Um, we have it here on the property in the Hort Field Lab. I occasionally find this creeping um, bluet, and it's, I think it's an annual species, uh, while the cerulea is a, a perennial uh, growing species. Uh, but it's literally just an inch or so tall. The, the cerulea might get anywhere from two to six inches tall uh, on that. So, but always welcome seeing those uh, in flower. And, uh, in the late winter and early spring. And again, another, the next plant is Sanguinaria canadensis. Um, you can find this here in Raleigh, especially on steep slopes uh, and lots of natural areas around here. It's one of the blood, it's blood root. Uh, and um, quite large, like anywhere from an inch to three, even sometimes four inch uh, flowers on this, but they're only open when the sun's out. So if you, and, and if the sun hasn't hit them, they won't open either. Uh, like if you're on the wrong side of the slope and the sun has gone around and they're not hitting it right now, they will be closed. But um, they are true ephemerals, the um, uh, blood roots, and they will open up anywhere from late February into early April. And then they quickly go into leaf and they have these 
funky, I don't know, somewhat horseshoe shaped leaf, but not exactly with some lobing on them. Um, and they are really cool just to see those too, but then they go dormant in uh, early summer uh, after the trees have fully expanded and they have no need for their leaves anymore. Uh, they've absorbed as much as they can uh, in that short amount of period. Uh, so let's see, the next one you may know as a couple different things. I have it on the, the, the screen as Thelictrum thelictroides. So the Thelictrum that the, looks like a Thelictrum, uh, more or less. Uh, it used to be Anenomella, uh, which is the name I like to use. So the, the little anemone, uh, more or less, um, with, that looks like a Thelictrum. Um, but they've lumped it back into the, the genus Thelictrum. And these, actually, you can occasionally find those for sale. And you can find bloodroot for sale, too to try in your own landscapes. Um, and there, a lot of the thelictrum, the thelictroides you find are some double flowered forms that are often um, pink. And so you even, typically in the wild, you see white forms, but there occasionally you'll find some that have a pink tint. My second photo of that is of a, a pale pink flowered one that I found here uh, actually on Crabtree Creek. And I think I don't know where the first picture of the thelictrons are. It might have been at Penny's Bend. I don't remember which one I've used because I've taken lots of pictures over the years. Um, of thelictrum thelictroides and it's it's uh, fairly common actually and again it can flower for over a very long amount of time for us here in the late winter and spring uh, the Feb late february again into early may uh, you can sometimes find it often on our steep banks in um, going down to um, uh, the streams that we have here in the piedmont uh, and I need to go to the other side of my list now and see what I have. So some that are going to be a little bit less common and a little bit later are some of the trillium species. And here in the Piedmont, we actually don't have that many native trillium. Uh, you get out into the mountains and there's a ton of different ones. But the two that uh, I know you can find fairly close here locally in Raleigh, uh, but one of them only in a matter of like two spots and the other is um, much more ubiquitous, but still never in large quantities. So the first one, that you will see there is Trillium catesbii, which is a pale pink nodding flower um, trillium. And those will flower typically late March and uh, into mid to late April is when I find those. Uh, I've seen them in uh, various places, anywhere from, again, excuse me, I'm blanking on the place that's on um, Holly Springs Road. Um, uh, but anyways, I've I uh, find them at uh, White Pine Preserve, various preserves in the, the Durham area. Um, you probably find them along the uh, Eno. Uh, uh, you have to look though, you have to know what you're looking for. And they, they, once you find them, you'll know what, the, uh, that they, what they are. Those three uh, leaves and then everything's in threes on those. So, and these will often be on dry slopes or, or sloping down to the stream banks and stuff, but not wet spots. The second one here that I have pictures of is Trillium pusillum, which Trillium pusillum is quite a, a cool plant. They are recognizing different forms of it. Sometimes they're wanting to split it out into new species um, based on their populations. I'm just lumping it, but I know of two spots in this area that you can find this. One of them is probably not open to the public, but the other is open to the public. And you can actually find it at, um, darn, I'm blanking. What's the sawmill or the, the mill uh, pond on? Nate's Mill Pond, if you go way in the back on the path that goes into the wet, boggy area in the back uh, side of Yates Mill Pond, there is a small population of pu uh, Trillium pusillum, which uh, occurs on these little raised mounds in the flooded uh, uh, forest there. Uh, there's a boardwalk that you can walk through and they're just within feet of the boardwalk. Uh, in one little location of, I'd say about 20 feet of that boardwalk, I find them um, and they flower late uh, March and into early April as well. There's a much bigger population, though still very localized, uh, um, east of Raleigh, a couple, uh, about an, uh, 45 minutes or so that I know of as well, but that one's not generally open to the public. So, but really cool to see those. Uh, and you can occasionally find uh, plants of pusillum though to grow. And if you can get it, that one actually will grow uh, in normal soil, despite the fact it grows in these wet boggy areas and it will multiply, but it is diminutive. It's only like three to six inches tall. Uh, the Kate's BI gets a lot bigger, uh, maybe a foot or so uh, when it's fully expanded, but, um, but two really cool plants to see if you can find them. 
Uh, okay, so the last few plants I'm going to talk about are some that might not be true ephemerals. I mean, they have, they're more evergreen or have parts that are actively growing year round, though um, they do their thing for just a short period in the early spring. And that's why I've included them in this uh, little lecture here. So, uh, and some of them are somewhat rare, but locally uh, common. And I know you can go into um, uh, Umstead and see some of the, actually, um, 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 probably three to four of these, actually four of the five that I have here. So anyways, the first one is a Pygia repens or trailing arbutus, uh, which is actually a little uh, subshrub, evergreen subshrub. It has evergreen leaves that are maybe two to three inches long along a semi-woody uh, stem that runs along the ground and has very fragrant pale pink flowers probably right about now, if you, you could start to find them into the middle part of uh, March. So there's only, there's a fairly short window to find these and they are flat on the ground. So you have to want to bend over for these. Um, and so you can smell them. Uh, and they're in the Ericaceae, so the blueberry family. So, um, but it's a cute little thing. They do not transplant. You cannot grow this in your landscape. So do not even try, uh, do not dig them up, please. Um, uh, and they are in often dry uh, forested areas, uh, uh, ex exposed spots. But uh, and I know of several spots, of, like I said, in Umstead, uh, Raven Rock. I know there's some down there. I've probably seen it other places and just can't think about uh, think of it at this moment. But um, uh, uh, they're locally common, um, but not uh, uh, common in general. Uh, but they are so nice to see if you get the opportunity. Um, what's the trail I'd like to go on? I think, um, darn, One, a couple of the trails I like to go on in Umstead have them. If you really look, I need to go and take a hike sometime soon. Um, the next plant is Hepatica americana, probably, I think. Is, what did Nobilis. I put? Nobilis. They keep on lumping it, so I never know what to call it. And I didn't actually refer to my slide to see what I put on there. But anyways, Hepatica, uh, the, uh, the liverworts. Um, these are, pro I would not be surprised if they're in flower right now. They are in the, the ranunculaceae, so the buttercup family, and they have these three lobe leaves that are often, they're evergreen, and they, um, they often have a camouflage type pattern to them, and they can be pretty on their own outright if you can find them. They're quite cryptic. You'll see them on uh, dry slopes, or actually shaded slopes, not necessarily dry, but uh, they only get like three inches tall maybe, uh, the plants when they're in flower, but the flowers can be white to soft blues and purples, um, even in our wild uh, populations. And uh, they look like little daisies, but they're, they are not daisies at all. They are buttercups. So um, I, you will find those, they are widely scattered and um, you can find them in the woods all around in the Piedmont area here. You just have to look at the right time, be there. And the flowers, the petals fall off them very quickly. So you have to be there when they are in flower. And it's just for uh, probably February, late February, and again through March, maybe the early April if you get into the right spots. So my next one is the one that you don't see terribly often, though it's one that you can grow in the landscape. And I actually have a plant right beside me is one I collected. Um, is a, uh, and it will be flowering probably in the next few weeks, um, Phlox nivalis. And it, this is related to the creeping phlox, um, uh, which are Phlox subulata, which actually that is native just north of here. You don't see it very uh, natively growing here, but you can find Nivalis in a few spots. It's a little more common in the, the Piedmont than subulata, uh, though subulata is the one you buy uh, in, the, in the stores. And, um, this is a little bit more prickly than Sabulata. I have it out on our roof garden. I have it right here uh, in this bed as well. But um, this is a white flowered form that I found, which is I think the second picture I have of it. But um, where I found this was in Chatham County along a, a country road. Uh, I think it's like Mountain, let's see, Church Mountain or Church View uh, or Mountain View Church. Mountain View Church Road in Chatham County. Uh, there's populations of this and it'll be in flower in late March uh, into early April. 
um, along the road, you'll see spots of white and pink in a few spots. And that's where I found it and I was able to collect a few cuttings of, in particular, and I, um, I got this growing here in the garden now. Um, but it, it looks very reminiscent of that creeping phlox uh, when it's in flower, but it, it grows on grassy uh, open areas. That's why I say some of these, uh, in the summer, this is probably, um, covered in grass and you would never see it but when it's all cut back in the fall uh, and you know the, the trimmers who come along and mow along the roads it makes a perfect spot for this phlox and it uh, does its thing and then it's done um, but um, it will be uh, flowering here shortly and if I actually it is in bud uh, so next few weeks and so I have two more here. Uh, the next one is Saxifraga or um, Virgin, uh, Virginiensis, or now I think they are lumping it in, or splitting it out into a new genus, Micranthes, uh, either that or maybe it's an old genus, I'm not sure, but they've split a lot of our native Saxifrags uh, into um, the genus Micranthes. And there's some in uh, probably pretty much all parts of the state, but Virginiensis is one that's pretty ubiquitous here. And I find it along stream banks. I mean, literally on the, the bank that is sloping right down to the stream, uh, ready to fall in almost in our wooded stream banks here. And um, if you go along Crabtree Creek or along the Eno, you will find these commonly flowering in March and into April. Um, and along some of the, like the, um, further south along the deep river and uh, the, uh, the um, other rivers along here, you will find this plant on slopes. Um, and it's tiny little white flowers on a spike. Um, and uh, they again have a, an evergreen rosette. And um, so I kind of lump them, but they aren't exactly a true ephemeral, but they do their thing and then they are done. Uh, and probably would actually make a decent um, garden plant if you could find a source for it but don't go digging things up. <laughs> so my last plant is, starts with a Z, uh, and is the Zephyranthes adamasco. So these are the adamasco lilies, and these flower the, um, anywhere uh, late March and, and through April is when we find these. These are our native rain lily, and I lump these here because, um, and, and with ephemerals, because they are only the spring thing. They, they are not like the cultivated um, rain lilies that we grow here from Mexico in the southwestern, uh, south central part of the United States, uh, where there's more Zephyranthes and their cousins. Um, uh, this only flowers in the spring and then it's done. And, and it may keep its foliage most of the year. It does go dormant through the, the winter uh, months. It loses its leaves and then it, they're already pushing new leaves up now. And if you go in the, the woods, you'll often find these on flooded woods again. Um, there's some really nice populations along the, um, uh, darn, just blanking again. Um, Swift Creek area, I know. Um, you can find these in Umstead. You can find them, uh, large colonies of them I have seen in um, near Flower Hill in um, uh, east of here and actually across the road from where that second population of pulse, uh, Trillium pulse pusillum uh, is that I can't tell you where it's at, but anyways. Um, it, it, they are quite common locally. So you can find, see them along the roads as you drive. They were actually flowering just uh, down the, the same, in the same field as the, the Phlox nivalis that I have um, pictures of there. So, um, so those are some of the ephemerals that you might find here in the coming weeks. There's so many more different parts of the state, like the mountains will have a totally different flora than what we have. And if you go out to the coast, there will be some other uh, things you pick up uh, if you get out there. So, but so much that could actually be shown, but in such little amount of time, uh, those are the ones I have come up with to show you today. Do we have any questions? We sure do. So right out of the gate, Sharon wanted to know what native ephemerals grow in drier upland woods. Okay, so that uh, those cardamony actually tend to be at drier upland conditions. Um, some things that might not be true ephemerals and being again, uh, but they do flower in the spring would be um, the crest, uh, the, um, that is the iris cristatus. Um, and let's see, we'll get different violets, which again, I didn't put those in here, but those might be considered ephemerals as well. Um, some of the, uh, I mean, the um, 
Trillium catesbii, uh, another uh, green and gold, Chrysogonum, which can flower just about any time of the year. So that's part of the reason I didn't include that here, but um, it does its main thing typically in, uh, in the late winter and early spring. Uh, those will be some that you're gonna find in the upland conditions uh, around here. Okie dokie. Marilyn wanted to know, does the Anastasia Hyacinth have a good or strong fragrance like the white one? It's light. It's not as good, but this has been flowering for a lot longer. And it's one of the smaller cluster flowered um, uh, hyacinths. It's not one of the big uh, club shaped ones. So um, it, there aren't as many florets to smell. <laughs> Okie dokie. So Sandy wanted to know, will some or any of Tim's featured ephemerals be replanted? I'm assuming the ones you pulled up <laughs> out of the ground. And will they survive for blooming next year? Uh, actually, I probably will. Uh, uh, I'll probably replant some of these. My Arvanthus, I, I really want to get back in the ground. And this iris, actually, it was just planted about a month ago. So um, the crocus is one that has actually survived not getting eaten by the, uh, the squirrels out of uh, the lawn. And the um, galanthus I'll probably put back in. And uh, yeah, I could put all these back in the ground. Okay, so there's none of them that are like definitely no point in trying. No, nope, those should in. all be worth planting again. Now all the flowers were cut, so aside from that. So. Uh, sure. Okie dokie. Candace would like to know, please tell us which of the natives are easier to grow. Since you <laughs> noted that many of the, the, the Mediterranean ones are real tough. She wants to know which of the-, the Actually, natives. the Mediterranean ones are super easy, but um, uh, some that might grow for you, if you. The thing is sourcing so many of them, they aren't widely available. What do I have on here? You'll occasionally find bloodroot. They're not terribly difficult. They aren't gonna grow in um, a new, development planting. That's the trouble with those houses that are just newly planted and you have scraped clay. They are not going to grow in that. You might get actually the phlox, phlox um, novalis if you can find that, or subulatas. You can definitely find those, though there's so many collections, I mean cultivars of those now, but they're not from right here. They're from a little bit further north. You'll actually, you can find them growing almost together in spots just north, uh, north of Durham, but um, they don't, aren't common here in this part of the Piedmont. Um, what else do I have on here? I've never tried Claytonia, but um, you, you might get that to grow. But again, finding a source of it, I encourage you not to go out and dig things up. What I actually did with this flocks is I took cuttings. Uh, so I really, I left the, I did not steal the plant. I just <clears throat> took a top off of it, just like the lawnmower that it mows the berms. Um, and uh, Erythronium umbilicatum, if you can get a source of them, I know Juniper or Plant Delights at sometimes has had those in the past. They are not widely available. Um, I would plant them in the green if you can get them, but you can get those to grow. They want, I mean, uh, the uh, deciduous forest conditions. So um, Thelictrum thelictroides is readily available uh, fairly often. Uh, uh, you, that is especially nurseries. So, uh, and some of the cardamines, some of the cardamines actually spread excessively and can be used as um, short term or cool season ground covers. Um, so um, let's see, who else do I have here? Um, if, like I said, the Trillium pusillum, if you can source it in Catesby, they actually do make good uh, garden plants if you uh, get them in the right spot in a, a shaded conditions. Uh, and Adamasco lilies, um, you can get those. And sometimes if you, uh, you know where to find, the, uh, get a good nursery for those. Those are fine and dandy in our landscapes. All righty. Marilyn says that she's heard that some of the Corydalus is very weedy. Do you know which species those are? <laughs> this one could be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, this is one of our native little Corydalus, which it, it's just a little yellow flower. And I see it mixed in with other things. It's uh, so in the wild, it's just there for a short period. And it's probably, I i don't even know if it's an, a perennial. I think it's probably a short-lived a perennial or an annual. Um, and it only grows through our summers and then comes up in the fall and then grows in flowers and bolts very quickly um, in the late winter and early spring. So yeah, could be. Um, so other corinalis, we can't grow worth anything. The, a lot of the um, 
uh, Eurasian ones do not like us here at all. Um, there's just a handful that will make our summers here. Um, they don't like it. The blue ones that we wish we could grow from East Asia, um, uh, those definitely aren't weeds here. They, they say, save me, I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. So Marilyn would like to know which of the ephemerals do well in a garden or backyard woodland, by which she means which ones do the deer and rabbits leave alone? <laughs> Actually, probably a lot of these, the deer, I mean, the rabbits have like my flocks. So mm -hmm. not that, but that wouldn't be a woodland one. But a lot of those are probably, I mean, I won't say the rabbits won't eat them, but I see these in high uh, deer uh, areas, no problem. So, I mean, they're the things that survive. Uh, though I won't say that they won't touch them. Um, yeah, they have literally, some of these occur in mass numbers. So it might be that the, the deer aren't bothering them just because there's so much of it at one time, you can't tell even. So, I mean, they'd be worth a try, but um, there's no telling if when you have high uh, densities of deer, um, but, um, you know, they'd be, I mean, they've been around. They're natives. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, Johnny would like to know which, if any of these, do well over in the coast. Uh, on the coast, I didn't do my coast stuff here. Um, I would assume you're probably going to find the Claytonia virginica out there. What do I have on here? Uh, some of the Erythroniums, you'd see Houstonia probably. Uh, a lot of these will also be out there. The Actually, the if you can find it, Trillium pusillum, there's a couple different, like I said, there's some really localized populations of those. And there's a couple of them that only occur on the coast. Um, yeah, the Adamasco lilies, definitely. They can form um, large populations in grassy areas out there. So. Okie dokie. And, well, that appears to be all of the questions. Okay. So, thank you so much, Tim, for well, pulling you're this presentation together for us. It was, I appreciate that you included both the exotics and the natives just because, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I needed something, I mean, analogs to what we grow in our garden. Yeah, for sure. No kidding. And thank you everybody for joining us for this presentation today. We will be back for the midweek program next week. Goodness me, what are we doing next week? I do not. Oh boy. Next week, we're going deeper in the garden talking evergreen Asian magnolias. So make sure oh. you join us at three o'clock on Wednesday for that. There's we'll, a few in flower right now. No kidding. There's, <laughs> there's quite a few in flower. The Arboretum is it's a brilliant time of year for magnolias. Make sure you But the evergreen ones, there's a few of those in flower right now. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. We will see you all next week. Y'all take care. I can stand up. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> is my leg asleep?